When you think of church cooperation, what comes to mind? Webster's Dictionary defines cooperation as a willingness or ability to work with another person. And there are numerous synonyms that are available to assist us in our understanding of a cooperation, like pulling together or joining forces or, or chipping in, basically doing your part. Biblically, the concept of cooperation is illustrated by Israel's efforts to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem as they were setting their hands and cooperating to do good, as we see in the book of Nehemiah. It says in Nehemiah 2 and verse 18 that they had a mind to work. So what does cooperation mean for us today? So as we continue in our study of God's blueprint for growing church by Brother Mike Winkler, today we want to talk about cooperation. And that cooperation, when we follow God's blueprint for His church, is pledged and performed. Pray you're all doing well. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great and glorious name. We thank you so much for this day, Father. We thank you so much for the love that you bestow upon us so gracefully, even though we don't deserve it, Father. And we're so grateful that you call us your children. We're thankful for this time together that we can open up your word and study from it, Father. We're so grateful that as we open up your word, we can see the blueprint and the design that you give us for the church for which Jesus died and purchased with his blood. Father, we're thankful that we can be a part of that institution, that we have the opportunity, and certainly those that are outside the body of Christ can know your truth and come to a knowledge and understanding of obedience that they might receive salvation through you. Father, we pray as we go through this class now that we have open hearts and open minds, that we understand the importance of cooperation and what it means to be united and fitly joined together in Christ and in you. Father, we thank you so much for the church for which Jesus Christ died. We thank you for our elders that oversee the congregation here, and we pray for all the congregations throughout the world who are striving to do your will and glorify your name. Father, we pray that you lift up the hands of our elders and watch over them, give them strength and guidance. We're so thankful for them and their love for us, and we pray you continue to bless them and their families. We thank you so much for our deacons who do have a mind to work and continue to strive to push forward to elevate the works here at Cary, even though we're uh, struggling somewhat now because of the virus, Father, but we're so grateful that we continue to see improvement every day and that we can get back to that normalcy very soon, and we look forward to that day in just a month or so. Father, we thank you so much for our members here at Cary. We thank you for our families and pray you'll continue to bless them during these times. Watch over those who might be physically suffering or that are sick at this time. Pray that you'll bless them. Certainly those that might be struggling. We pray for their loved ones who are watching over them and pray that you'll bless them. Father, we do want to say thank you for all of those who improved and continue to do better and we thank you for their recovery. And we also pray for those who might be suffering at this time whether it's spiritually, Father, or mentally, and help us to recognize those things, but also help them to reach out to their brothers and sisters in Christ that we might help them and encourage them and lift them up. Father, we thank you so much for the country in which we live, for the freedoms that we enjoy, and we pray those freedoms continue to abound. But Father, regardless of whether or not they do, we understand our responsibility to continue to stand on the promises of your word and teach those around us. Father, we thank you so much for all that you give us, for the many blessings of life, many of which we take for granted. We thank you for our military who protect us and provide us with those freedoms and pray that you bless them and their families and bring them home soon for those that are abroad. Father, we pray now again as we go through this class that we'll have open hearts and open minds, and we thank you so much for Jesus, for the love that abounds through him, and certainly for the sacrifice that offers us eternity. Father, walk with us as you always do. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And so again, when you think about cooperation as the church and, and our responsibility, when we follow through with God's blueprint, it's pledged and it's performed. Cooperation is obviously important for the body, but why is it important? Well, if the church is going to function properly and effectively, the church, as we know, is characterized as the body throughout the New Testament. So it's got to work together. You know, if you've ever been sick or been to the doctor, something's not working right within your body, whether it's, you know, you're having issues with numbness or, you know, you're having blood pressure or whatever the case is, that affects every other part of the body, doesn't it? And, and so you try to get that into lockstep with the rest of your body. And so the doctor is going to diagnose you and they're going to try and figure out and they're going to either offer medicine or physical therapy or something that's going to get your body back to functioning as one unit. 
Paul, in writing to the church in Rome, said, For we are as many as, or for as we have many members of one body, so being one body in Christ. Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. Again, we know the church is the body, and Jesus is the head of that body, Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and following. And it's composed of that body of penitent believers, those who have been saved, who have been baptized for the remission of their sins, and who have been added to the body of Christ, Acts 2, 47. And so the body also makes up individual Christians who compose the different parts of the body. And each member has a specific and designated job or responsibility. We all bring something different to the table. That's the blessing and the uniqueness of the body of Christ. And we must never depreciate any other part of the body to think less of something, right? It's expected to function and work cooperatively, right? That, that's what we're looking for is we have cooperation so the church can grow as God desires. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, again Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So again, Paul is giving us this illustration as he paints the narrative for us that the body has to work together, joined and knit together by every by what every joint supplies. So every part of the body has a responsibility. But what happens though if the body doesn't function as it needs to? We begin to see problems. But there's an illustration that Brother Winkler uses in the book that, that I certainly want to make sure that we pull out. That's a great illustration. For the church to function as a body, there are some things that we need and that must function properly. First, the eyes. The eyes are important because they see evangelistic opportunities that God has placed before us. And so it's important that we see last week in our Bible class, we talked about how important evangelism is, and it's the first order of business, if you recall. So it's important because we're trying to bring new members into the body that might be saved. And so these eyes must pay attention and and notice those that are around us that are hurting, who are lost, that need Jesus, right? Luke 19, 10, Jesus came to seek and to save those that are lost. And so we've got to see just as Jesus sees. The next thing that Brother Winkler says is, is our ears, that that will call, that will hear the calls of the distant shores and cried for the daily needs. And so those that are hurting, those that need benevolent um, benevolence, we need to listen to their, their hurts and their wants and their cares and their pains, right? As we see those that are hurting, we can also hear those that are hurting. The next thing that Brother Winkler talks about is our, is our hands, that these hands will work, understanding the urgency of the kingdom's work. That is, we have the mind to work, as we see in Nehemiah chapter 2, but that we use our hands to the work. We can't just simply point around and, and say, well, boy, there's some work that needs to be done. I recall there was, a, there was always this joke when I was stationed and in, in living in San Diego and California. You had the California Department of Transportation, CDOT. And anytime you would go by, you would see four guys leaning on a shovel and only one guy digging. And so the joke was, in, in essence, that their hands never seemed to be working, but their mouths were always moving, telling the one guy, on the, the little man on the totem pole, what he needs to do. That's not how the church works. And it's important for us to understand, though we're a larger congregation here at Cary, just because that's the case, it doesn't mean that everybody doesn't play a role. Sometimes we think, well, this is a pretty large body, so somebody else is going to do it. Well, if everybody has that, that mindset and that attitude, The work's never going to get done. So we've got to understand the urgency to put our hands to work in God's kingdom. Well, Brother Winkler then says, what about the feet? They'll go where God needs us, right? When we see the growth of the church in Acts chapter 8 and throughout the New Testament, as we see the church growing in in Acts chapter 8 and following, we see that they were going throughout everywhere, preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's important that we make sure that we're always moving towards the common good of growing the church. What about our tongues? Where are you going to use those as we see, using our eyes and paying attention with our ears? We're going to use our tongues to talk and to teach those that are lost. As we see Acts 5 and verse 42 and following the many other verses as they were talking and teaching and encouraging people and teaching them about the salvation of Jesus, right? What about our backs? It's interesting you think backs. Well, 
They're going to bear the burdens of others, Galatians 6, 2. As we bear the burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. And so sometimes we've got to bear the burdens of our brothers and sisters who are hurting that the church might continue to move forward. We all go through difficulties in life and struggles and, and trials, but it's important that we help bear up those burdens. Well, what about our arms? Brother Wickler says that we'll encircle others with love, right? I look forward to the day when obviously, hopefully, as we see the end of the tunnel and the light at the end of the tunnel, we know as we get through this this COVID and this virus mess that one day we can embrace each other in fellowship. That's one of the things that I miss and being able to embrace and love on each other as we do, but we're going to be, in, to be able to encircle each other with the love of God. And finally, he talks about our hearts. Obviously, the spiritual side of us, our spiritual hearts are important because our hearts are going to be concerned with the eternal destiny of others. That is, we have a love for each other. And so we've got to cooperate. The church, cooperation in the church is important because it's the key to every achievement, whether those achievements are big or small. And as we see the importance of the function of the body here, that Brother Winkler gives us this illustration and, and how important it is for us to understand as we look through all these different parts of the body as he lists, all of those parts of the body play a distinctive and important role. Just as all of us that are part of the Church of Christ play an important and distinctive role. So it's important to understand that as we cooperate, it's good for the church, whether those things are big or small. There's an ancient Chinese proverb that Brother Winkler lists that says, being any able man, there is always other able men. So let me say that again. Being any able man, there is always other able men. One Bible class teacher that was kind of striving to stress the importance of cooperation in the church affirmed, as we've seen, and I think Julie puts this on our, she's put this on the overhead before. It says, we cannot spell Sunday without you. We cannot spell church without you. We cannot spell success without you. We are counting on you. And so that you is very important for the cooperation of the church. The truth that cooperation is the key to any achievement is obviously given to us or evidenced to us by multiple achievements that are exemplified throughout the Bible. Esther, remember how she, how she worked with Mordecai to save God's people from extinction in Esther chapter 3 and verses or chapter through chapter 7 or, or 8, I think. And so the people of Jerusalem, if you think about, again, as we mentioned in Nehemiah chapter 2, joined hands. And you think you had some individuals that were working and putting the wall together, and others were backing them up, protecting them from those that were coming against them. But they joined hands to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. And so they came together. It's amazing to see the cooperation that took place that they can accomplish such a great task. You think about the, the, the paralytics, four friends who worked together to get him to Jesus to be healed in Mark chapter 2 that lowered him through the roof that he could be and see Jesus that he might be healed. The early church, obviously they cooperated to spread the gospel throughout the world as we, as we read in Colossians 1 and verse 23. Paul was able to achieve great things for the cause of Christ with the cooperation of his fellow workers that he mentions in Romans chapter 16 and as he talks about the church in Philippi and the love they had and expressing towards him and spreading the gospel of Christ. Cooperation is extremely important in the church because if we don't have that blueprint designed cooperation that God talks about, the consequences are tragic. A consequence is the outcome of a choice. Galatians 6 verses 7 through 8, Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will reap of the flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit of the Spirit will reap everlasting life. The work of the church can be hindered, including her outreach, whether it's locally or globally, if we don't have cooperation, if we're not joined together. So is there a particular mindset that we need to have? Is there an attitude? Well, certainly. So what attitudes make cooperation possible? Well, somebody else will do it. You'll take care of it, right? Obviously, that's not the attitude that we should have. So today for the church to grow and for the church to enjoy a spirit of cooperation, there must be an attitude of humility in her members. We must never forget our sufficiency as God and not of ourselves. Everything we do is not for us. It's for the glory and the betterment of the body of Christ. And so we must never, again, 
forget our sufficiency of God. Paul, in writing to the Corinthian church and all of their problems, says, and we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And so we must never think of ourselves more highly than we should. Oh, well, look at all these people I've got coming to church and I'm doing more work than you. That's not a cooperative spirit. Or or look at the the Bible studies I have as opposed to what are you doing? Why, Why aren't you doing more? It should be more of encouragement rather than belittlement. We must always follow the example of Jesus who manifested a spirit of humility throughout his ministry. Even though it was short on earth, just less than four years, Always remember that the church, the work and cooperative spirit that we have in the work of the church is for God and not for us. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 is a great example. He says to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We, we grow discouraged and certainly you've heard me say this from the pulpit in classes many times. I do not tolerate laziness, especially in my household for my children. I expect a lot of my kids, you know, I expect them to pull their weight. Why? Because we're a family. All of us have a specific role, need, and responsibility. And I taught my children this from a very early age. And for my boys who have grown up and moved out of the house, it's done well for them because of that. I I know when they look back, they probably didn't like it, but I was raised the same way. And for that, I was grateful. You know, you look back, obviously, you don't always understand it when you're growing up. But as you begin to move forward, you understand why we must always be abounding in the work of the Lord. God doesn't tolerate laziness either. And so again, we must make sure that we always have that spirit to do the work of the church and for the church to enjoy the spirit of cooperation. There must be an attitude of unselfishness, right, in our in her members. Again, it's not for us and what's going to be good for me that I might get what I want for the church out of the church. Paul defined unselfishness in Philippians chapter 2. Paul writes, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. It's not about me. It's not about what I want or what I think is good. It's what's going to be good for the church, even if it means pushing me to the, to the background. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. I'm going to raise everyone up. I'm going to elevate others as I lower myself. Why? Because we must look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. We have that responsibility. For for cooperation to be effective, we must understand that it's about others, right? Cooperating, coming together. But then he later illustrates this even further by painting a narrative and giving us a picture of Jesus and what that might look like. Notice what he says later in the verse, in the chapter. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Again, verse 5, to think like Christ, to have that spirit of Christ, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Now, let me stop that for just a moment. Christ could have put himself out there and said, look at me. I am the Son of God. Look at the power I have and the mightiness that I have and the glory that I have, and you're going to pay attention to me, and you're going to follow me, and I'm the man. Well, yes, he was the man, but that's not the attitude that he had as the man. It said that he humbled himself and made himself of no reputation. He didn't put himself in the forefront. When I think of leadership, and I love to study leadership, when I think of some of the great leaders and leaders that I, I, I've learned from over the years, whether it was in the secular world or in the military, even in the church, those leaders never made it about themselves. They always made sure everyone else was first. They didn't make it about their own reputation to build themselves up. They did it for the betterment of the church, and they always took responsibility for everything around them. Jesus didn't make himself of reputation and and make himself great and glorious and put himself out there. We don't even have a painting of a picture in the Bible through words of what Jesus looked like. But he said, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeliness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and those in heaven and and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. 
And so we can see here that as Paul paints and illustrates what unselfishness looks like through the example of Jesus Christ. And so he exalted himself. He lifted himself up. We demonstrate selflessness when we strive to promote others and not ourselves. And it's evident when we do that. Notice what Paul then re records in Philippians chapter 2 as we turn back a couple of chapters. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For we are all of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served me in the gospel. So we've got to possess, as we see here, and exhibit a servant's heart. Paul writes in Galatians chapter 5, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty, not to, or only, to do not use, only do not use liberty, he says, as an opportunity for those, or for through the love to serve others, for all have fulfilled the law in one word. Even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, but if you, what, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by another person. And so when we think about this, and the importance of this, we've always got to focus on what's best for others. Notice 1 Corinthians 10, let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. And so when we must be totally committed to Jesus, following his example of ministry to the needs of others. Again, we see it recorded for us in Acts 10, and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Again, Paul records in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-5, through 5, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that what? That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in riches of liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing and what? To implore us, right? Imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So they were willing to give of themselves as they cooperated for the betterment of the church that it might be built up and glorified. They came together. And so it's the same thing that we must remember as we come together for the glory of God and the betterment of the church. Why? Because if we don't, the church is not going to grow. The church is not going to be glorified. The church is not going to move forward. So it's something for which we must strive. Why do we do that? Because that's what we see painted for us in the Bible. That's what we see as the church continues to grow and move forward. Working with others, it's not always easy. I understand that. However, when the church pursues God's blueprint for a growing church, every member is going to possess and demonstrate an attitude of cooperation. The church will work as a body. Again, the importance of that with every member doing their part. Read Mark chapter 14 and verse 8. But if the body chooses not to cooperate... Unfortunately, it hinders the efforts of the church in moving forward. And she's not going to be as effective as God intended her to be. So we've got to resolve to become humble servants in our spirit and meekness and attitude, right? Be dependable workers, unselfish team players. We've all heard that, that notable cliche, there's no I in team. And it's certainly true when it comes to building up and working for the church. And when we do that, the church is going to grow. And most importantly, God is going to be glorified. So that's the end by which we strive. We're always looking to do it for the church to cooperate. And sometimes that means setting aside our selfish desires and what we want, right? Unfortunately, too many people out there are trying to hurt the church with their mouths, with their attitudes, with their spirits, whatever. But we've got to continue to press forward. We don't live in a society now that understand what it means to cooperate and get along. And that's unfortunate. But we have a responsibility to show the world how that works. And so we should be cooperating within the church. People don't walk into the church and see a disunified, jointed, unjoined spirit of individuals. They see us loving each other and coming together, no matter race, creed, background, economic, social, class, whatever. Those things don't matter because we're all one in Christ, and that's what we strive for. And so I pray that we continue to strive towards that means. Looking forward to being able to worship together in just a few short moments. Thank you again for being here if you're visiting with us online, and I pray that all of you have a blessed and wonderful week. Take care, and may God bless you.